Preparation for a Christian Life, comprising about one-fourth of the whole book, by Soren Kierkegaard, translated by Lee M. Hollander. The Invitation Come hither unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 The Invitation Section 1. Come hither. It is not at all strange if he who is in danger and needs help, speedy, immediate help, perhaps, it is not strange if he cries out, Come hither. Nor is it strange that a quack cries his wares, Come hither, I cure all maladies. Alas, for in the case of the quack, it is only too true that it is the physician who has need of the sick. Come hither all ye who at extortionate prices can pay for the cure, or at any rate for the medicine. Here is physic for everybody who can pay. Come hither. In all other cases, however, it is generally true that he who can help must be sought and when found may be difficult of access. And if access is had, his help may have to be implored a long time. And when his help has been implored a long time, he may be moved only with difficulty. That is, he sets a high price on his services. And sometimes, precisely when he refuses payment, or generously asks for none, it is only an expression of how infinitely high he values his services. On the other hand, he, Christ, who sacrificed himself, he sacrifices himself here too. It is indeed he who seeks those in need of help, is himself the one who goes about and calls almost imploringly come hither he the only one who can help and help with what alone is indispensable and can save from the one truly mortal disease he does not wait for people to come to him but comes himself without having been called for it is he who calls out to them it is he who holds out help and what help? Indeed, that simple sage of antiquity, Socrates, was as infinitely right as the majority who do the opposite are wrong in setting no great price, whether on himself or his instruction, even if he thus, in a certain sense, proudly expressed the utter difference in kind between payment and his services. But he was not so solicitous as to beg any one to come to him, notwithstanding, or shall I say because, he was not altogether sure what his help signified. For the more sure one is that his help is the only one obtainable, the more reason has he, in a human sense, to ask a great price for it. And the less sure one is, the more reason has he to offer freely the possible help he has in order to do at least something for others. But he who calls himself the Savior and knows that he is, he calls out solicitously, Come hither unto me. Come hither, all ye. Strange. For if he who, when it comes to the point, perhaps cannot help a single one, if such a one should boastfully invite everybody, that would not seem so very strange, man's nature being such as it is. But if a man is absolutely sure of being able to help, and at the same time willing to help, willing to devote his all in doing so, and with all sacrifices, then he generally makes at least one reservation, which is to make a choice among those he means to help. 
That is, however willing one may be, still it is not everybody one cares to help. One does not care to sacrifice oneself to that extent. But he, the only one who can really help, and really help everybody, the only one, therefore, who really can invite everybody, he makes no conditions whatever, but utters the invitation which, from the beginning of the world, seems to have been reserved for him. Come hither, all ye. Ah, human self-sacrifice, even when thou art most beautiful and noble, when we admire thee most, this is a sacrifice still greater, which is to sacrifice every provision for one's own self, so that in one's willingness to help there is not even the least partiality. Ah, the love that sets no price on oneself, that makes one forget altogether that he is the helper, and makes one altogether blind as to who it is one helps, but infinitely careful only that he be a sufferer, whatever else he may be, and thus willing unconditionally to help everybody. Different, alas, is this from everybody. Come hither unto me. Strange, for human compassion also, and willingly, does something for them that labor and are heavy laden. One feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, makes charitable gifts, builds charitable institutions, and if the compassion be heartfelt, perhaps even visits those that labor and are heavy laden. But to invite them to come to one, that will never do, because then all one's household and manner of living would have to be changed. For a man cannot himself live in abundance, or at any rate in well-being and happiness, and at the same time dwell in one and the same house together with, and in daily intercourse with, the poor and miserable, with them that labor and are heavy laden. In order to be able to invite them in such wise, a man must himself live altogether in the same way, as poor as the poorest, as lowly as the lowliest, familiar with the sorrows and sufferings of life, and altogether belonging to the same station as they whom he invites, that is, they who labor and are heavy laden. If he wishes to invite a sufferer, he must either change his own condition to be like that of the sufferer, or else change that of the sufferer to be like his own. For if this is not done, the difference will stand out only the more by contrast. And if you wish to invite all those who suffer, for you may make an exception with one of them and change his condition, it can be done only in one way which is to change your condition, so as to live as they do, provided your life be not already lived thus, as was the case with him who said, Come hither unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Thus said he, and they who lived with him saw him, and behold, there was not even the least thing in his manner of life to contradict it. With the silent and truthful eloquence of actual performance his life expresses, even though he had never in his life said these words, his life expresses, Come hither unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He abides by his word, or he himself is the word. 
he is what he says, and also in this sense, he is the word. John chapter 1, 1. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. Strange. His only concern is lest there be a single one who labors and is heavy laden, who does not hear this invitation. Neither does he fear that too many will come. Ah, heart room makes house room. But where wilt thou find heart room, if not in his heart? He leaves it to each one how to understand his invitation. He has a clear conscience about it, for he has invited all those that labor and are heavy laden. But what means it, then, to labor and be heavy laden? Why does he not offer a clearer explanation, so that one may know exactly whom he means? And why is he so chary of his words? Ah, thou narrow-minded one! He is so chary of his words, lest he be narrow-minded. And thou narrow-hearted one, he is so chary of his words, lest he be narrow-hearted. For such is his love, and love has regard to all, as to prevent any one from troubling and searching his heart, whether he too be among those invited. And he who would insist on a more definite explanation, is he not likely to be some self-loving person who is calculating whether this explanation does not particularly fit himself? One who does not consider that the more of such exact explanations are offered, the more certainly some few would be left in doubt as to whether they were invited Ah, oh, man, why does thine eye see only thyself? Why is it evil? Because he is good. Matthew chapter 20 verse 15 The invitation to all men opens the arms of him who invites, and thus he stands of aspect everlasting. But no sooner is a closer explanation attempted, which might help one or the other to another kind of certainty, than his aspect would be transformed, and, as it were, a shadow of change would pass over his countenance. I will give you rest. Strange, for then the words, Come hither unto me, must be understood to mean stay with me, I am rest, or it is rest to remain with me. It is not then, as in other cases, where he who helps and says, Come hither, must afterwards say, Now depart again, explaining to each one where the help he needs is to be found, where the healing herb grows which will cure him, or where the quiet spot is found where he may rest from labor, or where the happier continent exists where one is not heavy laden. But, no, he who opens his arms, inviting everyone, ah, if all, all they that labor and are heavy laden came to him, he would fold them all to his heart, saying, Stay with me now, for to stay with me is rest. The helper himself is the help. Ah, strange, he who invites everybody and wishes to help everybody, his manner of treating the sick is as if calculated for every sick man, and as if every sick man who comes to him were his only patient. For otherwise, a physician divides his time among many patients, who, however great their number, still are far, far from being all mankind. He will prescribe the medicine, he will say what is to be done, 
and how it is to be used, and then he will go to some other patient. Or, in case the patient should visit him, he will let him depart. The physician cannot remain sitting all day with one patient, and still less can he have all his patients about him in his home, and yet sit all day with one patient without neglecting the others. For this reason, the helper and his help are not one and the same thing. The help which the physician prescribes is kept with him by the patient all day, so that he may constantly use it, while the physician visits him now and again, or he visits the physician now and again. But if the helper is also the help, why then he will stay with the sick man all day, or the sick man with him. Ah, strange that it is just this helper who invites all men. Come hither, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What enormous multiplicity, what an almost boundless diversity of people invited. For a man, a lowly man, may indeed try to enumerate only a few of these diversities, but he who invites must invite all men, even if every one, specially and individually. The invitation goes forth, then, along the highways and the byways, and along the loneliest paths, Aye, goes forth where there is a path so lonely that one man only, and no one else, knows of it, and goes forth where there is but one track, the track of the wretched one who fled along that path with his misery, that and no other track, goes forth even where there is no path to show how one may return. Even there the invitation penetrates and by itself easily and surely finds its way back most easily indeed when it brings the fugitive along to him that issued the invitation come hither come hither all ye also thou and thou and thou too thou loneliest of all fugitives thus the invitation goes forth and remains standing wheresoever there is a parting of the ways in order to call out ah just as a trumpet call of the soldiers is directed to the four quarters of the globe likewise does this invitation sound wherever there is a meeting of roads with no uncertain sound for who would then come but with the certitude of eternity it stands by the parting of the ways where worldly and earthly sufferings have set down their crosses and calls out come hither all ye poor and wretched ones ye who in poverty must slave in order to assure yourselves not of a carefree but of a toilsome future ah bitter contradiction to have to slave for assuring oneself of that under which one groans of that which one flees ye despised and overlooked ones about whose existence no one ay no one is concerned not so much even as about some domestic animal which is of greater value ye sick and halt and blind and deaf and crippled come hither ye bedridden ay come hither ye too for the invitation makes bold to invite even the bedridden to come ye lepers for the invitation breaks down all differences in order to unite all it wishes to make good the hardship caused by the difference in men the difference which seats one as a ruler over millions in possessions of all gifts of fortune and drives another one out into the wilderness. And why? Ah, the cruelty of it. Because, ah, the cruel human inference. Because he is wretched, indescribably wretched. Why, then? Because he stands in need of help, or at any rate of compassion. And why, then? because human compassion is a wretched thing which is cruel when there is the greatest need of being compassionate and compassionate only when at bottom it is not true compassion ye sick of heart 
ye who only through your anguish learn to know that a man's heart and an animal's heart are two different things and what it means to be sick at heart what it means when the physician may be right in declaring one sound of heart and yet heart sick ye whom faithlessness deceived and whom human sympathy for the sympathy of man is rarely late in coming whom human sympathy made a target for mockery all ye wronged and aggrieved and ill-used all ye noble ones who as any and everybody will be able to tell you deservedly reap the reward of ingratitude for why were ye simple enough to be noble why foolish enough to be kindly and disinterested and faithful all ye victims of cunning of deceit of backbiting of envy whom baseness chose as its victim and cowardice left in the lurch whether now ye be sacrificed in remote and lonely places after having crept away in order to die or whether ye be trampled under foot in the thronging crowds where no one asks what rights ye have and no one what wrongs ye suffer and no one where ye smart or how ye smart whilst the crowd with brute force tramples you into the dust come ye hither the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where death parts death and life come hither all ye that sorrow and ye that vainly labor for indeed there is rest in the grave but to sit by a grave or to stand by a grave or to visit a grave all that is far from lying in the grave and to read to oneself again and again one's own words which one knows by heart the epitaph which one devised oneself and understands best namely who it is that lies buried here all that is not the same as to lie buried oneself in the grave there is rest but by the grave there is no rest for it is said so far and no farther and so you may as well go home again but however often whether in your thoughts or in fact you return to that grave you will never get any farther you will not get away from the spot and this is very trying and is by no means rest come ye hither therefore here is the way by which one may go farther here is rest by the grave rest from the sorrow over loss or rest in the sorrow of loss through him who everlastingly reunites those that are parted and more firmly than nature unites parents with their children and children with their parents for alas they were parted and more closely than the minister unites husband and wife for alas their separation did come to pass and more indissolubly than the bond of friendship unites friend with friend for alas it was broken separation penetrated everywhere and brought with it sorrow and unrest but here is rest come hither also ye who had your abodes assigned to you among the graves ye who are considered dead to human society but neither missed nor mourned not buried and yet dead that is belonging neither to life nor to death ye alas to whom human society cruelly closed its doors and from whom no grave has as yet opened itself in pity come hither ye also here is rest and here is life the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away from the enclosure of innocence ah come hither ye are so close to him but a single step in the opposite direction and ye are infinitely far from him very possibly ye do not stand in need of rest nor grasp fully what that means but still follow the invitation so that he who invites may save you from a predicament out of which it is so difficult and dangerous to be saved and so that being saved you may stay with him who is the saviour of all likewise of innocence for even if it were possible that innocence be found somewhere and altogether pure why should not innocence also need a saviour to keep it safe from evil 
the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away to enter more deeply into sin come hither all ye who have strayed and have been lost whatever may have been your error and sin whether one more pardonable in the sight of man and nevertheless perhaps more frightful or one more terrible in the sight of man and yet perchance more pardonable whether it be one which became known here on earth or one which though hidden yet is known in heaven and even if ye found pardon here on earth without finding rest in your souls or found no pardon because ye did not seek it or because ye sought it in vain ah return and come hither here is rest the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away for the last time and to the eye is lost in perdition ah return return and come hither do not shrink from the difficulties of the retreat however great do not fear the irksome way of conversion however laboriously it may lead to salvation whereas sin with winged speed and growing pace leads forward or downward so easily so indescribably easy as easily in fact as when a horse altogether freed from having to pull cannot even with all his might stop the vehicle which pushes him into the abyss do not despair over each relapse which the god of patience has patience enough to pardon and which a sinner should surely have patience enough to humble himself under nay fear nothing and despair not he that saith come hither he is with you on the way from him come help and pardon on that way of conversion which leads to him and with him is rest come hither all all ye with him is rest and he will raise no difficulties he does but one thing he opens his arms he will not first ask you you sufferer as righteous men alas are accustomed to even when willing to help are you not perhaps yourself the cause of your misfortune have you nothing with which to reproach yourself it is so easy to fall into this human error and from appearances to judge a man's success or failure for instance if a man is a cripple or deformed or has an unprepossessing appearance to infer that therefore he is a bad man or when a man is unfortunate enough to suffer reverses so as to be ruined or as to go down in the world to infer that therefore he is a vicious man ah and this is such an exquisitely cruel pleasure this being conscious of one's own righteousness as against the sufferer explaining his afflictions as god's punishment so that one does not even dare to help him or asking him that question which condemns him and flatters your own righteousness before helping him but he will not ask you thus will not in such cruel fashion be your benefactor and if you are yourself conscious of your sin he will not ask about it will not break still further the bent reed but raise you up if you will but join him he will not point out by way of contrast and place you outside of himself so that your sin will stand out as still more terrible but he will grant you a hiding place within him and hidden within him your sins will be hidden for he is the friend of sinners let him but behold a sinner and he not only stands still opening his arms and says come hither nay but he stands and waits as did the father of the prodigal son or he does not merely remain standing and waiting but goes out to search as the shepherd went forth to search for the strayed sheep or as the woman went to search for the lost piece of silver he goes nay he has gone but an infinitely longer way than any shepherd or any woman for did he not go the infinitely long way from being god to becoming man which he did to seek sinners
Come hither unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come hither, for he supposes that they that labor and are heavy laden feel their burden and their labor, and that they stand there now, perplexed and sighing, one casting about with his eyes to discover whether there is help in sight anywhere, another with his eyes fixed on the ground, because he can see no consolation, and a third with his eyes staring heavenward, as though help was bound to come from heaven, but all seeking. Therefore he saith, Come hither. But he invites not him who has ceased to seek and to sorrow, Come hither. For he who invites knows that it is a mark of true suffering if one walks alone and broods in silent disconsolateness without courage to confide in anyone and with even less confidence to dare to hope for help. Alas, not only he whom we read about was possessed of a dumb devil. No suffering which does not first of all render the sufferer dumb is of much significance no more than the love which does not render one silent for those sufferers who run on about their afflictions neither labor nor are heavy laden behold therefore the inviter will not wait till they that labor and are heavy laden come to him but calls them lovingly for all his willingness to help might perhaps be of no avail if he did not say these words and thereby take the first step for in the call of these words come hither unto me he comes himself to them ah human compassion sometimes perhaps it is indeed praiseworthy self-restraint sometimes perhaps even true compassion which may cause you to refrain from questioning him whom you suppose to be brooding over a hidden affliction but also how often indeed is this compassion but worldly wisdom which does not care to know too much. Ah, human compassion, how often was it not pure curiosity and not compassion, which prompted you to venture into the secret of one afflicted? And how burdensome it was, almost like a punishment of your curiosity, when he accepted your invitation and came to you. But he who saith these redeeming words, Come hither, he is not deceiving himself in saying these words, nor will he deceive you when you come to him in order to find rest by throwing your burden on him. He follows the promptings of his heart in saying these words, and his heart follows his words. If you then follow these words, they will follow you back again to his heart. This follows as a matter of course. Ah, will you not follow the invitation? come hither for he supposes that they that labor and are heavy laden are so worn out and overtaxed and so near swooning that they have forgotten as though in a stupor that there is such a thing as consolation alas or he knows for sure that there is no consolation and no help unless it is sought from him and therefore must he call out to them come hither come hither for is it not so that every society has some symbol or token which is worn by those who belong to it when a young girl is adorned in a certain manner one knows that she is going to the dance come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden come hither you need not carry an external and visible badge come but with your head anointed and your face washed if only you labor in your heart and are heavy laden come hither ah do not stand still and consider nay consider consider that with every moment you stand still after having heard the invitation you will hear the call more faintly and thus withdraw from it even though you are standing still come hither ah however weary and faint you be from work or from the long long and yet hitherto fruitless search for help and salvation and even though you may feel as if you could not take one more step and not wait one more moment without dropping to the ground 
ah but this one step and here is rest come hither but if alas there be one who is so wretched that he cannot come ah a sigh is sufficient your mere sign for him is also to come hither the pause come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i shall give you rest pause now but what is there to give pause that which in the same instant makes all undergo an absolute change so that instead of seeing an immense throng of them that labor and are heavy laden following the invitation you will in the end behold the very opposite that is an immense throng of men who flee back shudderingly scrambling to get away trampling all down before them so that if one were to infer the sense of what had been said from the result it produced one would have to infer that the words had been procul o procul este profani rather than come hither that gives pause which is infinitely more important and infinitely more decisive the person of him who invites not in the sense that he is not the man to do what he has said or not god to keep what he has promised no in a very different sense pause is given by the fact that he who invites is and insists on being the definite historic person he was eighteen hundred years ago and that he as this definite person and living under the conditions then obtaining spoke these words of invitation he is not and does not wish to be one about whom one may simply know something from history for example world history history proper as against sacred history for from history one cannot learn anything about him the simple reason being that nothing can be known about him he does not wish to be judged in a human way from the results of his life that is he is and wishes to be a rock of offence and the object of faith to judge him after the consequences of his life is a blasphemy for being god his life and the very fact that he was then living and really did live is infinitely more important than all the consequences of it in history a who spoke these words of invitation he that invites who is he jesus christ which jesus christ he that sits in glory on the right side of his father no from his seat of glory he spoke not a single word therefore it is jesus christ in his lowliness and in the condition of lowliness who spoke these words is then jesus christ not the same yes verily he is today and was yesterday and eighteen hundred years ago the same who abased himself assuming the form of a servant the jesus christ who spake these words of invitation it is also he who hath said that he would return again in glory in his return in glory he is again the same jesus christ but this has not yet come to pass is he then not in glory now assuredly that the christian believes but it was in his lowly condition that he spoke these words he did not speak them from his glory and about his return in glory nothing can be known for this can in the strictest sense be a matter of belief only 
but a believer one cannot become except by having gone to him in his lowly condition to him the rock of offence and the object of faith in other shape he does not exist for only thus did he exist that he will return in glory is indeed expected but can be expected and believed only by him who believes and has believed in him as he was here on earth jesus christ is then the same yet lived he eighteen hundred years ago in debasement and is transfigured only at his return as yet he has not returned therefore he is still the one in lowly guise about whom we believe that he will return in glory whatever is said and taught every word he spoke becomes io ipso untrue if we give it the appearance of having been spoken by christ in his glory nay he is silent it is the lowly christ who speaks the space of time between for example between his debasement and his return in glory which is at present about eighteen hundred years and will possibly become many times eighteen hundred this space of time or else what this space of time tries to make of christ the worldly information about him furnished by world history or church history as to who christ was as to who it was who really spoke these words all this does not concern us is neither here nor there but only serves to corrupt our conception of him and thereby renders untrue these words of invitation it is untruthful of me to impute to a person words which he never used but it is likewise untruthful and the words he used likewise become untruthful or it becomes untrue that he used them if i assign to him a nature essentially unlike the one he had when he did use them essentially unlike for an untruth concerning this or the other trifling circumstance will not make it untrue that he said them and therefore if it please god to walk on earth in such strict incognito as only one all-powerful can assume in guise impenetrable to all men if it please him and why he does it for what purpose that he knows best himself but whatever the reason and the purpose it is certain that the incognito is of essential significance i say if it please god to walk on earth in the guise of a servant and to judge from his appearance exactly like any other man if it please him to teach in this guise if now any one repeats his very words but gives the saying the appearance that it was god that spoke these words then it is untruthful for it is untrue that he spoke these words B. can one from history learn to know anything about christ no and why not because one cannot know anything at all about christ for he is the paradox the object of faith and exists only for faith but all historic information is communication of knowledge therefore one cannot learn anything about christ from history for whether now one learn little or much about him it will not represent what he was in reality hence one learns something else about him than what is strictly true and therefore learns nothing about him or gets to know something wrong about him that is one is deceived history makes christ look different from what he looked in truth and thus one learns much from history about christ no not about christ because about him nothing can be known he can only be believed c can one prove from history that christ was god 
Let me first ask another question. Is any more absurd contradiction thinkable than wishing to prove, no matter for the present, whether one wishes to do so from history, or from whatever else in the wide world one wishes to prove it, that a certain person is God? To maintain that a certain person is God, that is, professes to be God, is indeed a stumbling block in the purest sense. But what is the nature of a stumbling block? It is an assertion which is at variance with all human reason. Now think of proving that. But to prove something is to render it reasonable and real. Is it possible then to render reasonable and real what is at variance with all reason? Scarcely, unless one wishes to contradict oneself. One can prove only that it is at variance with all reason. The proofs for the divinity of Christ given in Scripture, such as the miracles and his resurrection from the grave, exist, too, only for faith. That is, they are no proofs, for they are not meant to prove that all this agrees with reason, but, on the contrary, are meant to prove that it is at variance with reason, and therefore a matter of faith. First, then, let us take up the proofs from history. Is it not eighteen hundred years ago now that Christ lived? Is not his name proclaimed and reverenced throughout the world? Has not his teaching, Christianity, changed the aspect of the world, having victoriously affected all affairs? Has then history not sufficiently, or more than sufficiently, made good its claim as to who he was, and that he was God? No, indeed. History has by no means sufficiently, or more than sufficiently, made good its claim, and in fact history cannot accomplish this in all eternity. However, as to the first part of the statement, it is true enough that his name is proclaimed throughout the world. As to whether it is reverenced, that I do not presume to decide. Also, it is true enough that Christianity has transformed the aspect of the world, having victoriously affected all affairs, so victoriously indeed, that everybody now claims to be a Christian. But what does this prove? It proves at most that Jesus Christ was a great man, the greatest, perhaps, who ever lived. But that he was God? Stop now! That conclusion shall, with God's help, fall to the ground. Now, if one intends to introduce this conclusion by assuming that Jesus Christ was a man, and then considers the 1800 years of history, namely, the consequences of his life, one may indeed conclude with a constantly rising superlative, he was great, greater, the greatest, extraordinarily and astonishingly, the greatest man who ever lived. If one begins, on the other hand, with the assumption of faith that he was God, one has, by so doing, stricken out and cancelled the 1800 years as not making the slightest difference one way or the other because the certainty of faith is on an infinitely higher plane. And one course or the other one must take, but we shall arrive at sensible conclusions only if we take the latter. If one takes the former course, one will find it impossible, unless by committing the logical error of passing over into a different category, one will find it impossible in the conclusion suddenly to arrive at the new category God. That is, one cannot make the consequence or consequences of a man's life suddenly prove at a certain point in the argument that this man was God. 
if such a procedure were correct one ought to be able to answer satisfactorily a question like this what must the consequence be how great the effects how many centuries must elapse in order to infer from the consequences of a man's life for such was the assumption that he was god or whether it is really the case that in the year three hundred christ had not yet been entirely proved to be god though certainly the most extraordinarily astonishingly greatest man who had ever lived but that a few more centuries would be necessary to prove that he was god in that case we would be obliged to infer that people in the fourth century did not look upon christ as god and still less they who lived in the first century whereas the certainty that he was god would grow with every century also that in our century this certainty would be greater than it had ever been a certainty in comparison with which the first centuries hardly so much as glimpsed his divinity you may answer this question or not it does not matter in general is it at all possible by the consideration of the gradually unfolding consequences of something to arrive at a conclusion different in quality from what we started with is it not sheer insanity providing man is sane to let one's judgment become so altogether confused as to land in the wrong category and if one begins with such a mistake then how will one be able at any subsequent point to infer from the consequences of something that one has to deal with an altogether different in fact infinitely different category a footprint certainly is the consequence of some creature having made it now i may mistake the track for that of let us say a bird whereas by nearer inspection and by following it for some distance i may make sure that it was made by some other animal very good but there was no infinite difference in quality between my first assumption and my latter conclusion but can i on further consideration and following the track still further arrive at the conclusion therefore it was a spirit a spirit that leaves no tracks precisely the same holds true of the argument that from the consequences of a human life for that was the assumption we may infer that therefore it was god is god then so like man is there so little difference between the two that while in possession of my right senses i may begin with the assumption that christ was human and for that matter has not christ himself affirmed that he was god on the other hand if god and man resemble each other so closely and are related to each other in such a degree that is essentially belong to the same category of beings then the conclusion therefore he was god is nevertheless just humbug because if that is all there is to being god then god does not exist at all but if god does exist and therefore belongs to a category infinitely different from man why then neither i nor anyone else can start with the assumption that christ was human and end with the conclusion that therefore he was god anyone with a bit of logical sense will easily recognize that the whole question about the consequences of christ's life on earth is incommensurable with the decision that he is god in fact this decision is to be made on an altogether different plane man must decide for himself whether he will believe christ to be what he himself affirmed he was that is god or whether he will not believe so what has been said mind you providing one will take the time to understand it 
is sufficient to make a logical mind stop drawing any inferences from the consequences of christ's life that therefore he was god but faith in its own right protests against every attempt to approach jesus christ by the help of historical information about the consequences of his life faith contends that this whole attempt is blasphemous faith contends that the only proof left unimpaired by unbelief when it did away with all the other proofs of the truth of christianity the proof which indeed this is complicated business i say which unbelief invented in order to prove the truth of christianity the proof about which so excessively much ado has been made in christendom the proof of eighteen hundred years as to this faith contends that it is blasphemy with regard to a man and it is true that the consequences of his life are more important than his life if one then in order to find out who christ was and in order to find out by some inference considers the consequences of his life why then one changes him into a man by this very act a man who like other men is to pass his examination in history and history is in this case as mediocre an examiner as any half-baked teacher in latin but strange by the help of history that is by considering the consequences of his life one wishes to arrive at the conclusion that therefore therefore he was god and faith makes the exact opposite contention that he who even begins with this syllogism is guilty of blasphemy nor does the blasphemy consist in assuming hypothetically that christ was a man no the blasphemy consists in the thought which lies at the bottom of the whole business the thought without which one would never start it and of whose validity one is fully and firmly assured that it will hold also with regard to christ the thought that the consequences of his life are more important than his life in other words that he was a man the hypothesis is let us assume that christ was a man but at bottom of this hypothesis which is not blasphemy as yet there lies the assumption that the consequences of a man's life being more important than his life this will hold true also of christ unless this is assumed one must admit that one's whole argument is absurd must admit it before beginning so why begin at all but once it is assumed and the argument is started we have the blasphemy and the more one becomes absorbed in the consequences of christ's life with the aim of being able to make sure whether or no he was god the more blasphemous is one's conduct and it remains blasphemous so long as this consideration is persisted in curious coincidence one tries to make it appear that providing one but thoroughly considers the consequences of christ's life this therefore will surely be arrived at and faith condemns the very beginning of this attempt as blasphemy and hence the continuance in it as a worse blasphemy history says faith has nothing to do with christ with regard to him we have only sacred history which is different in kind from general history sacred history which tells of his life and career when in abasement and tells also that he affirmed himself to be god he is the paradox which history never will be able to digest or convert into a general syllogism he is in his debasement the same as he is in his exaltation but the eighteen hundred years 
or let it be eighteen thousand years, have nothing whatever to do with this. The brilliant consequences in the history of the world, which are sufficient, almost, to convince even a professor of history that he was God, these brilliant consequences surely do not represent his return in glory. Forsooth, in that case, it were imagined rather meanly. The same thing over again. Christ is thought to be a man whose return in glory can be and can become nothing else than the consequences of his life in history. Whereas Christ's return in glory is something absolutely different and a matter of faith. He abased himself and was swathed in rags. He will return in glory. But the brilliant consequences in history, especially when examined a little more closely, are too shabby a glory, at any rate a glory of altogether incongruous nature, of which faith therefore never speaks, when speaking about his glory. History is a very respectable science indeed, only it must not become so conceited as to take upon itself what the Father will do, and clothe Christ in his glory, dressing him up with the brilliant garments of the consequences of his life, as if that constituted his return. That he was God in his debasement, and that he will return in glory, all this is far beyond the comprehension of history. Nor can all this be got from history, excepting by an incomparable lack of logic, and however incomparable one's view of history may be otherwise. How strange, then, that one ever wished to use history in order to prove Christ divine. D. Are the consequences of Christ's life more important than his life? No, by no means, but rather the opposite, for else Christ were but a man. There is really nothing remarkable in a man having lived. There have certainly lived millions upon millions of men. If the fact is remarkable, there must have been something remarkable in a man's life. In other words, there is nothing remarkable in his having lived, but his life was remarkable for this or that. The remarkable thing may, among other matters, also be what he accomplished, that is, the consequences of his life but that God lived here on earth in human form. That is infinitely remarkable. No matter if his life had had no consequences at all, it remains equally remarkable, infinitely remarkable, infinitely more remarkable than all possible consequences. Just try to introduce that which is remarkable as something secondary, and you will straight away see the absurdity in doing so. Now, if you please, whatever remarkable is there in God's life having had remarkable consequences? To speak in this fashion is merely twaddle. No, that God lived here on earth, that is what is infinitely remarkable, that which is remarkable in itself. Assuming that Christ's life had had no consequences whatsoever, if any one then undertook to say that therefore his life was not remarkable, it would be blasphemy, for it would be remarkable all the same. And if a secondary remarkable characteristic had to be introduced, it would consist in the remarkable fact that his life had no consequences. But if one should say that Christ's life was remarkable because of its consequences, then this again were a blasphemy, for it is his life which in itself is the remarkable thing. There is nothing very remarkable in a man's having lived, but it is infinitely remarkable that God has lived. God alone can lay so much emphasis on himself that the fact of his having lived becomes infinitely more important than all the consequences which may flow therefrom, 
and which then become a matter of history e a comparison between christ and a man who in his life endured the same treatment by his times as christ endured let us imagine a man one of the exalted spirits one who was wronged by his times but whom history later reinstated in his rights by proving by the consequences of his life who he was i do not deny by the way that all this business of proving from the consequences is a course well suited to a world which ever wishes to be deceived for he who was contemporary with him and did not understand who he was he really only imagines that he understands when he has got to know it by help of the consequences of the noble one's life still i do not wish to insist on this point for with regard to a man it certainly holds true that the consequences of his life are more important than the fact of his having lived let us imagine one of those exalted spirits he lives among his contemporaries without being understood his significance is not recognized he is misunderstood and then mocked persecuted and finally put to death like a common evildoer but the consequences of his life make it plain who he was history which keeps a record of those consequences reinstates him in his rightful position and now he is named in one century after another as the great and the noble spirit and the circumstances of his debasement are almost entirely forgotten it was blindness on the part of his contemporaries which prevented them from comprehending his true nature and wickedness which made them mock him and deride him and finally put him to death but be no more concerned about this for only after his death did he really become what he was through the consequences of his life which after all are by far more important than his life now is it not possible that the same holds true with regard to christ it was blindness and wickedness on the part of those times but be no more concerned about this history has now reinstated him from history we know now who jesus christ was and thus justice is done him ah wicked thoughtlessness which thus interprets sacred history like profane history which makes christ a man but can one then learn anything from history about jesus no nothing jesus christ is the object of faith one either believes in him or is offended by him but to know means precisely that such knowledge does not pertain to him history can therefore to be sure give one knowledge in abundance but knowledge annihilates jesus christ again ah the impious thoughtlessness for one to presume to say about christ's abasement let us be no more concerned about his abasement surely christ's abasement was not something which merely happened to him even if it was the sin of that generation to crucify him was surely not something that simply happened to him and perhaps would not have happened to him in better times christ himself wished to be abased and lowly his abasement that is his walking on earth in humble guise though being god is therefore a condition of his own making something he wished to be knotted together a dialectic knot which no one shall presume to untie and which no one will untie for that matter until he himself shall untie it when returning in his glory his case is therefore not the same as that of a man who through the injustice inflicted on him by his times was not allowed to be himself or to be valued at his worth while history revealed who he was for christ himself wished to be abased 
it is precisely this condition which he desired therefore let history not trouble itself to do him justice and let us not in an impious thoughtlessness presumptuously imagine that we as a matter of course know who he was for that no one knows and he who believes it must become contemporaneous with him in his abasement when god chooses to let himself be born in lowliness when he who holds all possibilities in his hand assumes the form of a humble servant when he fares about defenceless letting people do with him what they list he surely knows what he does and why he does it for it is at all events he who has power over men and not men who have power over him so let not history be so impertinent as to wish to reveal who he was lastly ah the blasphemy if one should presume to say that the persecution which christ suffered expresses something accidental if a man is persecuted by his generation it does not follow that he has the right to say that this would happen to him in every age in so far there is reason in what posterity says about letting bygones be bygones but it is different with christ it is not he who by letting himself be born and by appearing in palestine is being examined by history but it is he who examines his life is the examination not only of that generation but of mankind woe unto the generation that would presumptuously dare to say let bygones be bygones and forget what he suffered for history has now revealed who he was and has done justice by him if one assumes that history is really able to do this then the abasement of christ bears an accidental relation to him that is to say he thereby is made a man an extraordinary man to whom this happened through the wickedness of that generation a fate which he was far from wishing to suffer for he would gladly as is human have become a great man whereas christ voluntarily chose to be the lowly one and although it was his purpose to save the world wished also to give expression to what the truth suffered then and must suffer in every generation but if this is his strongest desire and if he will show himself in his glory only at his return and if he has not returned as yet and if no generation may be without repentance but on the contrary every generation must consider itself a partner in the guilt of that generation then woe to him who presumes to deprive him of his lowliness or to cause what he suffered to be forgotten and to clothe him in the fabled human glory of the historic consequences of his life which is neither here nor there f the misfortune of christendom but precisely this is the misfortune and has been the misfortune in christendom that christ is neither the one nor the other neither the one he was when living on earth nor he who will return in glory but rather one about whom we have learned to know something in an inadmissible way from history that he was somebody or other of great account in an inadmissible and unlawful way we have learned to know him whereas to believe in him is the only permissible mode of approach men have mutually confirmed one another in the opinion that the sum total of information about him is available if they but consider the result of his life and the following eighteen hundred years namely the consequences gradually as this became accepted as the truth all pith and strength was distilled out of christianity the paradox was relaxed 
one became a christian without noticing it without noticing in the least the possibility of being offended by him one took over christ's teachings turned them inside out and smoothed them down he himself guaranteeing them of course the man whose life had had such immense consequences in history all became plain as day very naturally since christianity in this fashion became heathendom there is in christendom an incessant twaddling on sundays about the glorious and invaluable truths of christianity its mild consolation but it is indeed evident that christ lived eighteen hundred years ago for the rock of offence and object of faith has become a most charming fairy story character a kind of a divine good old man people have not the remotest idea of what it means to be offended by him and still less what it means to worship the qualities for which christ is magnified are precisely those which would have most enraged one if one had been contemporaneous with him whereas now one feels altogether secure placing implicit confidence in the result and relying altogether on the verdict of history that he was the great man concludes therefore that it is correct to do so that is to say it is the correct and the noble and the exalted and the true thing if it is he who does it which is to say again that one does not in any deeper sense take the pains to understand what it is he does and that one tries even less to the best of one's ability and with the help of god to be like him in acting rightly and nobly and in an exalted manner and truthfully for not really fathoming it in any deeper sense one may in the exigency of a contemporaneous situation judge him in exactly the opposite way one is satisfied with admiring and extolling and is perhaps as was said of a translator who rendered his original word for word and therefore without making sense too conscientious one is perhaps also too cowardly and too weak to wish to understand his real meaning christendom has done away with christianity without being aware of it therefore if anything is to be done about it the attempt must be made to reintroduce christianity the pause part three he who invites is then jesus christ in his abasement it is he who spoke these words of invitation it is not from his glory that they are spoken if that were the case then christianity were heathendom and the name of christ taken in vain and for this reason it cannot be so but if it were the case that he who is enthroned in glory had said these words come hither as though it were so altogether easy a matter to be clasped in the arms of glory well what wonder then if crowds of men ran to him but they who thus throng to him merely go on a wild goose chase imagining they know who christ is but that no one knows and in order to believe in him one has to begin with his abasement he who invites and speaks these words that is he's whose words they are whereas the same words if spoken by someone else are as we have seen an historic falsification he is the same lowly jesus christ the humble man born of a despised maiden whose father is a carpenter related to other simple folk of the very lowest class the lowly man who at the same time which to be sure is like oil poured on the fire affirms himself to be god it is the lowly jesus christ who spoke these words and no word of christ not a single one have you permission to appropriate to yourself you have not the least share in him are not in any way of his company 
if you have not become his contemporary in lowliness in such fashion that you have become aware precisely like his contemporaries of his warning blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me matthew eleven verse six you have no right to accept christ's words and then lie him away you have no right to accept christ's words and then in a fantastic manner and with the aid of history utterly change the nature of christ for the chatter of history about him is literally not worth a fig it is jesus christ in his lowliness who is the speaker it is historically true that he said these words but so soon as one makes a change in his historic status it is false to say that these words were spoken by him this poor and lowly man then with twelve poor fellows as his disciples all from the lowest class of society for some time an object of curiosity but later on in company only with sinners publicans lepers and madmen for one risked honor life and property or at any rate and that we know for sure exclusion from the synagogue by even letting oneself be helped by him come hither now all ye that labor and are heavy laden ah uh, my friend even if you were deaf and blind and lame and leprous if you which has never been seen or heard before united all human miseries in your misery and if he wished to help you by a miracle it is possible that as is human you would fear more than all your sufferings the punishment which was set on accepting aid from him the punishment of being cast out from the society of other men of being ridiculed and mocked day after day and perhaps of losing your life it is human and it is characteristic of being human were you to think as follows no thank you in that case i prefer to remain deaf and blind and lame and leprous rather than accept aid under such conditions come hither come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden ah come hither lo he invites you and opens his arms ah when a gentlemanly man clad in a silken gown says this in a pleasant harmonious voice so that the words pleasantly resound in the handsome vaulted church a man in silk who radiates honor and respect on all who listen to him ah when a king in purple and velvet says this with the christmas tree in the background on which are hanging all the splendid gifts he intends to distribute why then of course there is some meaning in these words but whatever meaning you may attach to them so much is sure that it is not christianity but the exact opposite something as diametrically opposed to christianity as may well be for remember who it is that invites and now judge for yourself for that you have a right to do whereas men really do not have a right to do what is so often done namely to deceive themselves that a man of such appearance a man whose company every one shuns who has the least bit of sense in his head or the least bit to lose in the world that he well this is the absurdest and maddest thing of all one hardly knows whether to laugh or to weep about it that he indeed that is the very last word one would expect to issue from his mouth for if he had said come hither and help me or leave me alone or spare me or proudly i despise you all we could understand that perfectly but that such a man says come hither to me why i declare that looks inviting indeed and still further all ye that labor and are heavy laden as though such folk were not burdened enough with troubles as though they now to cap all should be exposed to the consequences of associating with him 
and then finally i shall give you rest what's that he help them ah i am sure even the most good-natured joker who was contemporary with him would have to say surely that was the thing he should have undertaken last of all to wish to help others being in that condition himself why it is about the same as if a beggar were to inform the police that he had been robbed for it is a contradiction that one who has nothing and has had nothing informs us that he has been robbed and likewise to wish to help others when oneself needs help most indeed it is humanly speaking the most hare-brained contradiction that he who literally hath not where to lay his head that he about whom it was spoken truly in a human sense behold the man that he should say come hither unto me all ye that suffer i shall help now examine yourself for that you have a right to do you have a right to examine yourself but you really do not have a right to let yourself without self-examination be deluded by the others into the belief or to delude yourself into the belief that you are a christian therefore examine yourself supposing you were contemporary with him true enough he alas he affirmed himself to be god but many other madmen had made that claim and his times gave it as their opinion that he uttered blasphemy why was not that precisely the reason why a punishment was threatened for allowing oneself to be aided by him it was the godly care for their souls entertained by the existing order and by public opinion lest any one should be led astray it was this godly care that led them to persecute him in this fashion therefore before any one resolves to be helped by him let him consider that he must not only expect the antagonism of men but consider it well even if you could bear the consequences of that step but consider well that the punishment meted out by men is supposed to be god's punishment of him the blasphemer of him who invites come hither now all ye that labor and are heavy laden how now surely this is nothing to run after some little pause is given which is most fittingly used to go around about by way of another street and even if you should not thus sneak out in some way always providing you feel yourself to be contemporary with him or sneak into being some kind of christian by belonging to christendom yet there will be a tremendous pause given the pause which is the very condition that faith may arise you are given pause by the possibility of being offended in him but in order to make it entirely clear and bring it home to our minds that the pause is given by him who invites that it is he who gives us pause and renders it by no means an easy but a peculiarly difficult matter to follow his invitation because one has no right to accept it without accepting also him who invites in order to make this entirely clear i shall briefly review his life under two aspects which to be sure show some difference though both essentially pertain to his abasement for it is always an abasement for god to become man even if he were to be an emperor of emperors and therefore he is not essentially more abased because he is a poor lowly man mocked and as scripture adds spat upon luke eighteen verse thirty two the pause part three he who invites is then jesus christ in his abasement it is he who spoke these words of invitation it is not from his glory that they are spoken if that were the case then christianity were heathendom 
and the name of Christ taken in vain, and for this reason it cannot be so. But if it were the case that he who is enthroned in glory had said these words, come hither, as though it were so altogether easy a matter to be clasped in the arms of glory, well, what wonder then if crowds of men ran to him? But they who thus throng to him merely go on a wild goose chase, imagining they know who Christ is. But that no one knows, and in order to believe in him, one has to begin with his abasement. He who invites and speaks these words, that is, he's whose words they are, whereas the same words, if spoken by someone else, are, as we have seen, an historic falsification. He is the same lowly Jesus Christ, the humble man, born of a despised maiden, whose father is a carpenter, related to other simple folk of the very lowest class. The lowly man, who at the same time, which, to be sure, is like oil poured on the fire, affirms himself to be God. It is the lowly Jesus Christ who spoke these words, and no word of Christ, not a single one, have you permission to appropriate to yourself. You have not the least share in him, are not in any way of his company, if you have not become his contemporary in lowliness, in such fashion that you have become aware precisely like his contemporaries, of his warning. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew 11, verse 6. You have no right to accept Christ's words and then lie him away. You have no right to accept Christ's words and then in a fantastic manner and with the aid of history utterly change the nature of Christ for the chatter of history about him is literally not worth a fig. It is Jesus Christ in his lowliness who is the speaker. It is historically true that he said these words, but so soon as one makes a change in his historic status, it is false to say that these words were spoken by him. This poor and lowly man then, with twelve poor fellows as his disciples, all from the lowest class of society, for some time an object of curiosity, but later on, in company only with sinners, publicans, lepers, and madmen, for one risked honor, life, and property, or at any rate, and that we know for sure, exclusion from the synagogue by even letting oneself be helped by him. Come hither now, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Ah. Uh, my friend, even if you were deaf and blind, and lame and leprous, if you, which has never been seen or heard before, united all human miseries in your misery, and if he wished to help you by a miracle, it is possible that, as is human, you would fear more than all your sufferings the punishment which was set on accepting aid from him the punishment of being cast out from the society of other men, of being ridiculed and mocked day after day, and perhaps of losing your life. It is human, and it is characteristic of being human, were you to think as follows. No, thank you. In that case, I prefer to remain deaf and blind and lame and leprous, rather than accept aid under such conditions come hither come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden ah come hither lo he invites you and opens his arms ah when a gentlemanly man clad in a silken gown says this in a pleasant harmonious voice so that the words pleasantly resound in the handsome vaulted church a man in silk who radiates honor and respect on all who listen to him. Ah, when a king in purple and velvet says this with the Christmas tree in the background, on which are hanging all the splendid gifts he intends to distribute, why then, of course, there is some meaning in these words. But whatever meaning you may attach to them, so much is sure 
that it is not christianity but the exact opposite something as diametrically opposed to christianity as may well be for remember who it is that invites and now judge for yourself for that you have a right to do whereas men really do not have a right to do what is so often done namely to deceive themselves that a man of such appearance a man whose company every one shuns who has the least bit of sense in his head or the least bit to lose in the world that he well this is the absurdest and maddest thing of all one hardly knows whether to laugh or to weep about it that he indeed that is the very last word one would expect to issue from his mouth for if he had said come hither and help me or leave me alone or spare me or proudly i despise you all we could understand that perfectly but that such a man says come hither to me why i declare that looks inviting indeed and still further all ye that labor and are heavy laden as though such folk were not burdened enough with troubles as though they now to cap all should be exposed to the consequences of associating with him and then finally i shall give you rest what's that he helped them ah i am sure even the most good-natured joker who was contemporary with him would have to say surely that was the thing he should have undertaken last of all to wish to help others being in that condition himself why it is about the same as if a beggar were to inform the police that he had been robbed for it is a contradiction that one who has nothing and has had nothing informs us that he has been robbed and likewise to wish to help others when oneself needs help most indeed it is humanly speaking the most hare-brained contradiction that he who literally hath not where to lay his head that he about whom it was spoken truly in a human sense behold the man that he should say come hither unto me all ye that suffer i shall help now examine yourself for that you have a right to do you have a right to examine yourself but you really do not have a right to let yourself without self-examination be deluded by the others into the belief or to delude yourself into the belief that you are a christian therefore examine yourself supposing you were contemporary with him true enough he alas he affirmed himself to be god but many other madmen had made that claim and his times gave it as their opinion that he uttered blasphemy why was not that precisely the reason why a punishment was threatened for allowing oneself to be aided by him it was the godly care for their souls entertained by the existing order and by public opinion lest any one should be led astray it was this godly care that led them to persecute him in this fashion therefore before any one resolves to be helped by him let him consider that he must not only expect the antagonism of men but consider it well even if you could bear the consequences of that step but consider well that the punishment meted out by men is supposed to be god's punishment of him the blasphemer of him who invites come hither now all ye that labor and are heavy laden how now surely this is nothing to run after some little pause is given which is most fittingly used to go around about by way of another street and even if you should not thus sneak out in some way always providing you feel yourself to be contemporary with him or sneak into being some kind of christian by belonging to christendom yet there will be a tremendous pause given the pause which is the very condition 
that faith may arise you are given pause by the possibility of being offended in him but in order to make it entirely clear and bring it home to our minds that the pause is given by him who invites that it is he who gives us pause and renders it by no means an easy but a peculiarly difficult matter to follow his invitation because one has no right to accept it without accepting also him who invites in order to make this entirely clear i shall briefly review his life under two aspects which to be sure show some difference though both essentially pertain to his abasement for it is always an abasement for god to become man even if he were to be an emperor of emperors and therefore he is not essentially more abased because he is a poor lowly man mocked and as scripture adds spat upon luke eighteen verse thirty two the first phase of his life and now let us speak about him in a homely fashion just as his contemporaries spoke about him and as one speaks about some contemporary let him be a man of the same kind as we are whom one meets on the street in passing of whom one knows where he lives and in what story what his business is who his parents are his family how he looks and how he dresses with whom he associates and there is nothing extraordinary about him he looks as men generally look in short let us speak of him as one speaks of some contemporary about whom one does not make a great ado for in living life together with these thousands upon thousands of real people there is no room for a fine distinction like this possibly this man will be remembered in centuries to come and at the same time he is really only a clerk in some shop who is no whit better than his fellows therefore let us speak about him as contemporaries speak about some contemporary i know very well what i am doing and i want you to believe that the canting and indolent world historic habit we have of always reverently speaking about christ since one has learned all about it from history and has heard so much about his having been something very extraordinary indeed or something of that kind that reverent habit i assure you is not worth a row of pins but is rather sheer thoughtlessness hypocrisy and as such blasphemy for it is blasphemy to reverence thoughtlessly him whom one is either to believe in or to be offended in it is the lowly jesus christ a humble man born of a maiden of low degree whose father is a carpenter to be sure his appearance is made under conditions which are bound to attract attention to him the small nation among whom he appears god's chosen people as they call themselves live in anticipation of a messiah who is to bring a golden period to land and people you must grant that the form in which he appears is as different as possible from what most people would have expected on the other hand his appearance corresponds more to the ancient prophecies with whom the people are thought to have been familiar thus he presents himself a predecessor has called attention to him and he himself fastens attention very decidedly on himself by signs and wonders which are noised abroad in all the land and he is the hero of the hour surrounded by unnumbered multitudes of people wherever he fares the sensation aroused by him is enormous everyone's eyes are fastened on him everyone who can go about ay even those who can only crawl must see the wonder 
and every one must have some opinion about him so that the purveyors of ready-made opinions are put to it because the demand is so furious and the contradiction so confusing and yet he the worker of miracles ever remains the humble man who literally hath not where to lay his head and let us not forget signs and wonders as contemporary events have a markedly greater elasticity in repelling or attracting than the tame stories generally rehashed by the priests and the still tamer stories about signs and wonders that happened eighteen hundred years ago signs and wonders as contemporary events are something plaguy and importunate something which in a highly embarrassing manner almost compels one to have an opinion something which if one does not happen to be disposed to believe may exasperate one excessively by thus forcing one to be contemporaneous with it indeed it renders existence too complicated and the more so the more thoughtful developed and cultured one is it is a peculiarly ticklish matter this having to assume that a man who is contemporaneous with one really performs signs and wonders but when he is at some distance from one when the consequences of his life stimulate the imagination a bit then it is not so hard to imagine in a fashion that one believes it as i said then the people are carried away with him they follow him jubilantly and see signs and wonders both those which he performs and those which he does not perform and they are glad in their hope that the golden age will begin once he is king but the crowd rarely have a clear reason for their opinions they think one thing today and another tomorrow therefore the wise and critical will not at once participate let us see now what the wise and critical must think so soon as the first impression of astonishment and surprise has subsided the shrewd and critical man would probably say even assuming that this person is what he claims to be that is something extraordinary for as to his affirming himself to be god i can of course not consider that as anything but an exaggeration for which i willingly make allowances and pardon him if i really consider him to be something extraordinary for i am not a pedant assuming then which i hesitate to do for it is a matter on which i shall at any rate suspend my judgment assuming then that he is really performing miracles is it not an inexplicable mystery that this person can be so foolish so weak-minded so altogether devoid of worldly wisdom so feeble or so good-naturedly vain or whatever else you please to call it that he behaves in this fashion and almost forces his benefactions on men instead of proudly and commandingly keeping people away from himself at a distance marked by their profoundest submission whenever he does allow himself to be seen at rare occasions instead of doing so think of his being accessible to everyone or rather himself going to everyone of having intercourse with everybody almost as if being the extraordinary person consisted in his being everybody's servant as if the extraordinary person he claims to be were marked by his being concerned only lest men should fail to be benefited by him in short as if being an extraordinary person consisted in being the most solicitous of all persons the whole business is inexplicable to me what he wants what his purpose is what end he has in mind what he expects to accomplish in a word what the meaning of it all is he who by so many a wise saying reveals so profound an insight into the human heart he must certainly know what i using but half of my wits can predict for him namely that in such fashion one gets nowhere in the world unless indeed despising prudence 
one consistently aims to make a fool of oneself or perchance goes so far in sincerity as to prefer being put to death but any one desiring that must certainly be crazy having such profound knowledge of the human heart he certainly ought to know that the thing to do is to deceive people and then to give one's deception the appearance of being a benefaction conferred on the whole race by doing so one reaps all advantages even the one whose enjoyment is the sweetest of all which is to be called by one's contemporaries a benefactor of the human race for once in your grave you may snap your fingers at what posterity may have to say about you but to surrender one's self altogether as he does and not to think the least of one's self in fact almost to beg people to accept these benefactions no i would not dream of joining his company and of course neither does he invite me for indeed he invites only them that labor and are heavy laden or he would reason as follows his life is simply a fantastic dream in fact that is the mildest expression one can use about it for when judging him in this fashion one is good-natured enough to forget altogether the evidence of sheer madness in his claim to be god this is wildly fantastical one may possibly live a few years of one's youth in such fashion but he is now past thirty years and he is literally nothing still further in a very short time he will necessarily lose all the respect and reputation he has gained among the people the only thing you may say he has gained for himself one who wishes to keep in the good graces of the people the riskiest chance imaginable i will admit he must act differently not many months will pass before the crowd will grow tired of one who is altogether at their service he will be regarded as a ruined person a kind of outcast who ought to be glad to end his days in a corner the world forgetting by the world forgot provided he does not by continuing his previous behavior prefer to maintain his present attitude and be fantastic enough to wish to be put to death which is the unavoidable consequence of persevering in that course what has he done for his future nothing has he any assured position no what expectations has he none even this trifling matter what will he do to pass the time when he grows older the long winter nights what will he do to make them pass why he cannot even play cards he is now enjoying a bit of popular favor in truth of all movable property the most movable which in a trice may turn into an enormous popular hatred of him join his company no thank you i am still thank god in my right mind or he may reason as follows that there is something extraordinary about this person even if one reserves the right both one's own and that of common sense to refrain from venturing any opinion as to his claim of being god about that there is really little doubt rather one might be indignant at providences having entrusted such a person with these powers a person who does the very opposite of what he himself bids us do that we shall not cast our pearls before the swine for which reason he will as he himself predicts come to grief by their turning about and trampling him under their feet one may always expect this of swine but on the other hand one would not expect that he who had himself called attention to this likelihood himself would do precisely what he knows one should not do if only there were some means of cleverly stealing his wisdom for i shall gladly leave him in indisputed possession of that very peculiar thought of his that he is god if one could but rob his wisdom without at the same time becoming his disciple 
if one could only steal up to him at night and lure it from him for i am more than equal to editing and publishing it and better than he if you please i undertake to astonish the whole world by getting something altogether different out of it for i clearly see there is something wondrously profound in what he says and the misfortune is only that he is the man he is but perhaps who knows perhaps it is feasible anyway to fool him out of it perhaps in that respect too he is good-natured and simple enough to communicate it quite freely to me it is not impossible for it seems to me that the wisdom he unquestionably possesses evidently has been entrusted to a fool seeing there is so much contradiction in his life but as to joining his company and becoming his disciple no indeed that would be the same as becoming a fool oneself or he might reason as follows if this person does indeed mean to further what is good and true i do not venture to decide this he is helpful at least in this respect to youths and inexperienced people for they will be benefited in this serious life of ours by learning the sooner the better and very thoroughly he opens the eyes even of the blindest to this that all this pretense of wishing to live only for goodness and truth contains a considerable admixture of the ridiculous he proves how right the poets of our times are when they let truth and goodness be represented by some half-witted fellow one who is so stupid that you can knock down a wall with him the idea of exerting oneself as this man does of renouncing everything but pains and trouble to be at beck and call all day long more eager than the busiest family physician and pray why because he makes a living by it no not in the least it has never occurred to him as far as i can see to want something in return does he earn any money by it no not a red cent he has not a red cent to his name and if he did he would forthwith give it away does he then aspire to a position of honor and dignity in the state on the contrary he loathes all worldly honor and he who as i said condemns all worldly honor and practices the art of living on nothing he who if any one seems best fitted to pass his life in a most comfortable dulce far niente which is not such a bad thing he lives under a greater strain than any government official who is rewarded by honor and dignity lives under a greater strain than any business man who earns money like sand why does he exert himself thus or why this question about a matter not open to question why should any one exert himself thus in order to attain to the happiness of being ridiculed mocked and so forth to be sure a peculiar kind of pleasure that one should push one's way through a crowd to reach the spot where money honor and glory are distributed why that is perfectly understandable but to push forward to be whipped how exalted how christian how stupid or he will reason as follows one hears so many rash opinions about this person from people who understand nothing and worship him and so many severe condemnations of him by those who perhaps misunderstand him after all as for me i am not going to allow myself to be accused of venturing a hasty opinion i shall keep entirely cool and calm in fact which counts for still more i am conscious of being as reasonable and moderate with him as is possible grant now which to be sure i do only to a certain extent grant even that one's reason is impressed by this person what then is my opinion about him my opinion is that for the present i can form no opinion about him 
i do not mean about his claim of being god for about that i can never in all eternity have an opinion no i mean about him as a man only by the consequences of his life shall we be able to decide whether he was an extraordinary person or whether deceived by his imagination he applied too high a standard not only to himself but also to humanity in general more i cannot do for him try as i may if he were my only friend my only child i could not judge him more leniently nor differently either it follows from this to be sure that in all probability and for good reasons i shall not ever be able to have any opinion about him for in order to be able to form an opinion i must first see the consequences of his life including his very last moments that is he must be dead then and perhaps not even then may i form an opinion of him and even granting this it is not really an opinion about him for he is then no more no more is needed to say why it is impossible for me to join him while he is living the authority he is said to show in his teaching can have no decisive influence in my case for it is surely easy to see that his thought moves in a circle he quotes as authority that which he is to prove which in its turn can be proved only by the consequences of his life provided of course it is not connected with that fixed idea of his about being god because if it is therefore he has this authority because he is god the answer must be yes if so much however i may admit that if i could imagine myself living in some later age and if the consequences of his life as shown in history had made it plain that he was the extraordinary person he in a former age claimed to be then it might very well be in fact i might come very near becoming his disciple an ecclesiastic would reason as follows for an impostor and demagogue he has to say the truth a remarkable air of honesty about him for which reason he cannot be so absolutely dangerous either even though the situation looks dangerous enough while the squall is at its height and even though the situation looks dangerous enough with his enormous popularity until the squall has passed over and the people yes precisely the people overthrow him again the honest thing about him is his claim to be the messiah when he resembles him so little as he does that is honest just as if someone in preparing bogus paper money made the bills so poorly that everyone who knows the least about it cannot fail to detect the fraud true enough we all look forward to a messiah but surely no one with any sense expects god himself to come and every religious person shudders at the blasphemous attitude of this person we look forward to a messiah we are all agreed on that but the governance of the world does not go forward tumultuously by leaps and bounds the development of the world as is indicated by the very fact that it is a development proceeds by evolution not by revolution the true messiah will therefore look quite different and will arrive as the most glorious flower and the highest development of that which already exists thus will the true messiah come and he will proceed in an entirely different fashion he will recognize the existing order as the basis of things he will summon all the clergy to council and present to them the results accomplished by him as well as his credentials and then if he obtain the majority of the votes when the ballot is cast he will be received and saluted as the extraordinary person as the one he is the messiah however there is a duplicity in this man's behavior 
he assumes too much the role of judge it seems as if he wished to be at one and the same time both the judge who passes sentence on the existing order of things and the messiah if he does not wish to play the role of the judge then why his absolute isolation his keeping at a distance from all which has to do with the existing order of things and if he does not wish to be the judge then why his fantastic flight from reality to join the ignorant crowd then why with the haughtiness of a revolutionary does he despise all the intelligence and efficiency to be found in the existing order of things and why does he begin afresh altogether and absolutely from the bottom up by the help of fishermen and artisans may not the fact that he is an illegitimate child fitly characterize his entire relation to the existing order of things on the other hand if he wishes to be only the messiah why then his warning about putting a piece of new cloth onto an old garment for these words are precisely the watchwords of every revolution since they are expressive of a person's discontent with the existing order and of his wish to destroy it that is these words reveal his desire to remove existing conditions rather than to build on them and better them if one is a reformer or to develop them to their highest possibility if one is indeed the messiah this is duplicity in fact it is not feasible to be both judge and messiah such duplicity will surely result in his downfall the climax in the life of a judge is his death by violence and so the poet pictures it correctly but the climax in the life of the messiah cannot possibly be his death or else by that very fact he would not be the messiah that is he whom the existing order expects in order to deify him this duplicity has not as yet been recognized by the people who see in him their messiah but the existing order of things cannot by any manner of means recognize him as such the people the idle the loafing crowd can do so only because they represent nothing less than the existing order of things but as soon as the duplicity becomes evident to them his doom is sealed why in this respect his predecessor has a far more definitely marked personality for he was but one thing the judge but what confusion and thoughtlessness to wish to be both and what still worse confusion to acknowledge his predecessor as the judge that is in other words precisely to make the existing order of things receptive and ripe for the messiah who is to come after the judge and yet not wish to associate himself with the existing order of things and the philosopher would reason as follows such dreadful or rather insane vanity that a single individual claims to be god is a thing hitherto unheard of never before have we been witness to such an excess of pure subjectivity and sheer negation he has no doctrines no system of philosophy he knows really nothing he simply keeps on repeating and making variations on some unconnected aphoristic sentences some few maxims and a couple of parables by which he dazzles the crowd for whom he also performs signs and wonders so that they instead of learning something or being improved come to believe in one who in a most brazen way constantly forces his subjective views on us there is nothing objective or positive whatever in him and in what he says indeed from a philosophical point of view he does not need to fear destruction for he has perished already since it is inherent in the nature of subjectivity to perish one may in all fairness admit that his subjectivity is remarkable and that 
be it as it may with the other miracles he constantly repeats his miracle with the five small loaves namely by means of a few lyric utterances and some aphorisms he rouses the whole country but even if one were inclined to overlook his insane notion of affirming himself to be god it is an incomprehensible mistake which to be sure demonstrates a lack of philosophic training to believe that god could reveal himself in the form of an individual the race the universal the total is god but the race surely is not an individual generally speaking that is the impudent assumption of subjectivity which claims that the individual is something extraordinary but sheer insanity is shown in the claim of an individual to be god because if the insane thing were possible namely that an individual might be god why then this individual would have to be worshipped and a more beastly philosophic stupidity is not conceivable the astute statesman would reason as follows that at present this person wields great power is undeniable entirely disregarding of course this notion of his that he is god foibles like these being idiosyncrasies do not count against a man and concern no one least of all a statesman a statesman is concerned only with what power a man wields and that he does wield great power cannot as i have remarked be denied but what he intends to do what his aim is i cannot make out at all if this be calculation it must be of an entirely new and peculiar order not so altogether unlike what is otherwise called madness he possesses points of considerable strength but he seems to defeat rather than to use it he expends it without himself getting any returns i consider him a phenomenon with which as ought to be one's rule with all phenomena a wise man should not have anything to do since it is impossible to calculate him or the catastrophe threatening his life it is possible that he will be made king it is possible i say but it is not impossible or rather it is just as possible that he may end on the gallows he lacks earnestness in all his endeavors with all his enormous stretch of wings he only hovers and gets nowhere he does not seem to have any definite plan of procedure but just hovers is it for his nationality he is fighting or does he aim at a communistic revolution does he wish to establish a republic or a kingdom with which party does he affiliate himself to combat which party or does he wish to fight all parties i have anything to do with him no that would be the very last thing to enter my mind in fact i take all possible precaution to avoid him i keep quiet undertake nothing act as if i did not exist for one cannot even calculate how he might interfere with one's undertakings be they ever so unimportant or at any rate how one might become involved in the vortex of his activities dangerous in a certain sense enormously dangerous is this man but i calculate that i may ensnare him precisely by doing nothing for overthrown he must be and this is done most safely by letting him do it himself by letting him stumble over himself i have at least at this moment not sufficient power to bring about his fall in fact i know no one who has to undertake the least thing against him now means to be crushed oneself no my plan is constantly to exert only negative resistance to him that is to do nothing and he will probably involve himself in the enormous consequences he draws after him till in the end he will tread on his own train as it were and thus fall and the steady citizen would reason as follows which would then become the opinion of his family 
now let us be human everything is good when done in moderation too little and too much spoil everything and as a french saying has it which i once heard a travelling salesman use every power which exceeds itself comes to a fall and as to this person his fall is certainly sure enough i have earnestly spoken to my son and warned and admonished him not to drift into evil ways and join that person and why because all people are running after him that is to say what sort of people idlers and loafers street walkers and tramps who run after everything but mighty few of the men who have house and property and nobody who is wise and respected none after whom i set my clock neither councillor johnson nor senator anderson nor the wealthy broker nelson oh no they know what's what and as to the ministry who ought to know most about such matters ah they will have none of him what was it pastor green said in the club the other evening that man will yet come to a terrible end he said and green he can do more than preach you oughtn't to hear him sundays in church so much as mondays in the club i just wished i had half his knowledge of affairs he said quite correctly and as if spoken out of his own heart only idlers and loafers are running after that man and why do they run after him because he performs some miracles but who is sure they are miracles or that he can confer the same power on his disciples and in any case a miracle is something mighty uncertain whereas the certain is the certain every serious father who has grown-up children must be truly alarmed lest his sons be seduced and join that man together with the desperate characters who follow him desperate characters who have nothing to lose and even these how does he help them why one must be mad to wish to be helped in this fashion even the poorest beggar is brought to a worse estate than his former one is brought to a pass he could have escaped by remaining what he was that is a beggar and no more and the mocker not the one hated on account of his malice but the one who is admired for his wit and liked for his good nature he would reason as follows it is after all a rich idea which is going to prove useful to all of us that an individual who is in no wise different from us claims to be god if that is not being a benefactor of the race then i don't know what charity and beneficence are if we assume that the characteristic of being god well who in all the world would have hit on that idea how true that such an idea could not have entered into the heart of man but if we assume that it consists in looking in no wise different from the rest of us and in nothing else why then we are all gods q e d three cheers for him the inventor of a discovery so extraordinarily important for mankind tomorrow i the undersigned shall proclaim that i am god and the discoverer at least will not be able to contradict me without contradicting himself at night all cats are gray and if to be god consists in looking like the rest of us absolutely and altogether like the rest of mankind why then it is night and we all are or what is it i wanted to say we are all god every one of us and no one has a right to say he isn't as well off as his neighbor this is the most ridiculous situation imaginable the contradiction here being the greatest imaginable and the contradiction always making for a comical effect but this is in no wise my discovery but solely that of the discoverer this idea that a man of exactly the same appearance as the rest of us only not half so well dressed as the average man that is a poorly dressed person who rather than being god 
seems to invite the attention of the society for the relief of the poor that he is god i am only sorry for the director of the charitable society that he will not get a raise from his general advancement of the human race but that he will rather lose his job on account of this etc ah my friend i know well what i am doing i know my responsibility and my soul is altogether assured of the correctness of my procedure now then imagine yourself a contemporary of him who invites imagine yourself to be a sufferer but consider well to what you expose yourself in becoming his disciple and following him you expose yourself to losing practically everything in the eyes of all wise and sensible and respected men he who invites demands of you that you surrender all give up everything but the common sense of your own times and of your contemporaries will not give you up but will judge that to join him is madness and mockery will descend cruelly upon you for while it will almost spare him out of compassion you will be thought madder than a march hare for becoming his disciple people will say that he is a wrong-headed enthusiast that can't be helped well and good but to become in all seriousness his disciple that is the greatest piece of madness imaginable there surely is but one possibility of being madder than a madman which is the higher madness of joining a madman in all seriousness and regarding him as a sage do not say that the whole presentation above is exaggerated ah you know but possibly have not fully realized it that among all the respectable men among all the enlightened and sensible men there was but one though it is easily possible that one or the other of them impelled by curiosity entered into conversation with him that there was but one among them who sought him in all seriousness and he came to him in the night and as you know in the night one walks on forbidden paths one chooses the night to go to places of which one does not like to be known as a frequenter consider the opinion of the inviter implied in this it was a disgrace to visit him something no man of honor could afford to do as little as to pay a nightly visit to but no i do not care to say in so many words what would follow this as little as come hither to me now all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest the second phase of his life his end was what all the wise and the sensible the statesmen and the citizens and the mockers etc predicted it would be and as was later spoken to him in a moment when it would seem the most hardest ought to have been moved to sympathy and the very stones to tears he saved others let him save himself and as it has been repeated thousands upon thousands of times by thousands upon thousands what was it he spoke of before saying his hour has not yet come is it now come perchance it has been repeated alas the while the single individual the believer shudders whenever considering while yet unable to refrain from gazing into the depth of what to men is a meaningless absurdity shudders when considering that god in human guise that his divine teaching that these signs and wonders which might have made a very sodom and gomorrah reform its ways in reality produced the exact opposite and caused the teacher to be shunned hated and despised who he is one can recognize more easily now when the powerful ones and the respected ones and all the precautionary measures of those upholding the existing order 
have corrected any wrong conception one might have entertained about him at first now when the people have lost their patience to wait for a messiah seeing that his life instead of rising in dignity lapsed into ever greater degradation who pray does not recognize that a man is judged according to the society in which he moves and now think of his society indeed his society one might well designate as equivalent to being expelled from human society for his society are the lowest class of the people with sinners and publicans among them people whom everybody with the slightest self-respect shuns for the sake of his good name and reputation and a good name and reputation surely are about the least one can wish to preserve in his company there are furthermore lepers whom every one flees madmen who can only inspire terror invalids and wretches squalor and misery who then is this person that though followed by such a company still is the object of the persecution of the mighty ones he is one despised as a seducer of men an impostor a blasphemer and if any one is enjoying a good reputation refrains from expressing contempt for him it is really only a kind of compassion for to fear him is to be sure something different such then is his appearance for take care not to be influenced by anything that you may have learned after the event as how his exalted spirit with an almost divine majesty never was so markedly manifest as just them ah my friend if you were the contemporary of one who is not only himself excluded from the synagogue but as you will remember whose very help meant being excluded from the synagogue i say if you were the contemporary of an outcast who in every respect answers to that term for everything has two sides then you will scarcely be the man to explain all this in terms directly contrary to appearances or which is the same thing you will not be the single individual which as you well know no one wants to be and to be which is regarded as a ridiculous oddity perhaps even as a crime and now for they are his society chiefly as to his apostles what absurdity though not what new absurdity for it is quite in keeping with the rest his apostles are some fishermen ignorant people who but the other day followed their trade and to-morrow to pile one absurdity on the other they are to go out into the wide world and transform its aspect and it is he who claims to be god and these are his duly appointed apostles now is he to make his apostles respected or are perhaps the apostles to make him respected is he the inviter is he an absurd dreamer indeed his procession would make it seem so no poet could have hit on a better idea a teacher a sage or whatever you please to call him a kind of stranded genius who affirms himself to be god surrounded by a jubilant mob himself accompanied by some publicans criminals and lepers nearest to him a chosen few his apostles and these judges so excellently competent as to what truth is these fishermen tailors and shoemakers they do not only admire him their teacher and master whose every word is wisdom and truth they do not only see what no one else can see his exaltedness and holiness nay but they see god in him and worship him certainly no poet could invent a better situation and it is doubtful if the poet would not forget the additional item that this same person is feared by the mighty ones and that they are scheming to destroy him his death alone can reassure and satisfy them they have set an ignominious punishment on joining his company on merely accepting aid from him 
and yet they do not feel secure and cannot feel altogether reassured that the whole thing is mere wrong-headed enthusiasm and absurdity thus the mighty ones the populace who had idolized him the populace have pretty nearly given him up only in moments does their old conception of him blaze forth again in all his existence there is not a shred the most envious of the envious might envy him to have nor do the mighty ones envy his life they demand his death for safety's sake so that they may have peace again when all has returned to the accustomed ways peace having been made still more secure by the warning example of his death these are the two phases of his life it began with the people idolizing him whereas all who were identified with the existing order of things all who had power and influence vengefully but in a cowardly and hidden manner laid their snares for him in which he was caught then yes but he perceived it well finally the people discovered that they had been deceived in him that the fulfillment he would bring them answered least of all to their expectations of wonders and mountains of gold so the people deserted him and the mighty ones drew the snares about him in which he was caught then yes but he perceived it well the mighty ones drew the snare together about him and thereupon the people who then saw themselves completely deceived turned against him in hatred and rage and to include that too compassion would say or among the compassionate ones for compassion is sociable and likes to assemble together and you will find spitefulness and envy keeping company with whining soft-headedness since as a heathen philosopher observed long ago no one is so ready to sympathize as an envious person among the compassionate ones the verdict would be it is really too bad that this good-hearted fellow is to come to such an end for he was really a good sort of fellow granting it was an exaggeration to claim to be god he really was good to the poor and the needy and even in an odd manner by becoming one of them and going about in the company of beggars but there is something touching in it all and one can't help but feel sorry for the poor fellow who is to suffer such a miserable death for you may say what you will and condemn him as strongly as you will i cannot help feeling pity for him i am not so hard-hearted as not to feel compassion we have arrived at the last phase not of sacred history as handed down by the apostles and disciples who believed in christ but of profane history its counterpart come hither now all ye that labor and are heavy laden that is if you feel the need even if you are of all sufferers the most miserable if you feel the need of being helped in this fashion that is to fall into still greater suffering then come hither he will help you the invitation and the inviter let us forget for a little while what in the strictest sense constitutes the offense which is that the inviter claims to be god let us assume that he did not claim to be more than a man and let us then consider the inviter and his invitation the invitation is surely inviting enough how then shall one explain the bad relation which did exist this terribly wrong relation that no one or practically no one accepted the invitation that on the contrary all or practically all alas and was it not precisely all who were invited that practically all were at one and offering resistance to the inviter in wishing to put him to death and in setting a punishment on accepting aid from him should one not expect that after an invitation such as he issued all all who suffered would come crowding to him 
and that all they who were not suffering would crowd to him touched by the thought of such compassion and mercy and that thus the whole race would be at one in admiring and extolling the inviter how is the opposite to be explained for that this was the outcome is certain enough and the fact that it all happened in those remote times is surely no proof that the generation then living was worse than any other generations how could any one be so thoughtless as to believe that for whoever gives any thought to the matter will easily see that it happened in that generation only because they chanced to be contemporaneous with him how then explain that it happened that all came to that terribly wrong end so opposite of what ought to have been expected well in the first place if the inviter had looked the figure which purely human compassion would have him be and in the second place if he had entertained the purely human conception of what constitutes man's misery why then it would probably not have happened in the first place according to this human conception of him he should have been a most generous and sympathetic person and at the same time possessed of all qualifications requisite for being able to help in all troubles of this world ennobling the help thus extended by a profound and heartfelt human compassion withal so they would imagine him he should also have been a man of some distinction and not without a certain amount of human self-assertion the consequence of which would be however that he would neither have been able in his compassion to reach down to all sufferers nor yet to have comprehended fully what constitutes the misery of man and of mankind but divine compassion the infinite unconcern which takes thought only of those that suffer and not in the least of oneself and which with absolute unconcern takes thought of all that suffer that will always seem to men only a kind of madness and they will ever be puzzled whether to laugh or to weep about it even if nothing else had militated against the inviter this alone would have been sufficient to make his lot hard in the world let a man but try a little while to practice divine compassion that is to be somewhat unconcerned in his compassion and you will at once perceive what the opinion of mankind would be for example let one who could occupy some higher rank in society let him not preserving all the while the distinction of his position lavishly give to the poor and philanthropically that is in a superior fashion visit the poor and the sick and the wretched no let him give up altogether the distinction of his position and in all earnest choose the company of the poor and the lowly let him live altogether with the people with workmen hodmen mortar mixers and the like ah uh, in a quiet moment when not actually beholding him most of us would be moved to tears by the mere thought of it but no sooner would they see him in this company him who might have attained to honor and dignity in the world see him walking along in such goodly company with a bricklayer's apprentice on his right side and a cobbler's boy on his left but well what then first they would devise a thousand explanations to explain that it is because of queer notions or obstinacy or pride or vanity that he chooses this mode of life and even if they would refrain from attributing to him these evil motives they will never be reconciled with the sight of him in this company the noblest person in the world will be tempted to laugh the moment he sees it and if all the clergymen in the world whether in velvet or in silk or in broadcloth or in satin contradicted me i would say you lie you only deceive people with your sunday sermons 
because it will always be possible for a contemporary to say about one so compassionate who it is to be kept in mind is our contemporary i believe he is actuated by vanity and that is why i laugh and mock at him but if he were truly compassionate or had i been contemporary with him the noble one why then and now as to those exalted ones who were not understood by men to speak in the fashion of the usual run of sermons why sure enough they are dead in this fashion these people succeeded in playing hide and seek you simply assume that every contemporary who ventures out so far is actuated only by vanity and as to the departed you assume that they are dead and that they therefore were among the glorious ones it must be remembered to be sure that every person wishes to maintain his own level in life and this fixed point this steady endeavor is one of the causes which limit human compassion to a certain sphere the cheesemonger will think that to live like the inmate of a poorhouse is going too far in expressing one's sympathy for the sympathy of the cheesemonger is biased in one regard which is his regard of the opinion of other cheesemongers and of the saloon keepers his compassion is therefore not without its limitations and thus with every class and the journalists living as they do on the pennies of the poor under the pretense of asserting and defending their rights they would be the first to heap ridicule on this unlimited compassion to identify oneself wholly and literally with him who is most miserable and this only this is divine compassion that is to men the too much by which one is moved to tears in a quiet sunday hour and about which one unconsciously bursts into laughter when one sees it in reality the fact is it is too exalted a sight for daily use one must have it at some distance to be able to support it men are not so familiar with exalted virtue to believe it at once the contradiction seen here is therefore that this exalted virtue manifests itself in reality in daily life quite literally the daily life when the poet or the orator illustrates this exalted virtue that is pictures it in a poetical distance from real life men are moved but to see this exalted virtue in reality the reality of daily life here in copenhagen on the market square in the midst of busy everyday life and when the poet or the orator does touch people it is only for a short time and just so long as men are able to believe almost in this exalted virtue but to see it in real life every day to be sure there is an enormous contradiction in the statement that the most exalted of all has become the most everyday occurrence in so far then it was certain in advance what would be the inviter's fate even if nothing else had contributed to his doom the absolute or all which makes for an absolute standard becomes by that very fact the victim for men are willing enough to practice sympathy and self-denial are willing enough to strive for wisdom etc but they wish themselves to determine the standard and to have that read to a certain degree they do not wish to do away with all these splendid virtues on the contrary they want at a bargain and in all comfort to have the appearance and the name of practicing them truly divine compassion is therefore necessarily the victim so soon as it shows itself in this world it descends on earth out of compassion for mankind and yet it is mankind who trample upon it and whilst it is wandering about among them scarcely even the sufferer dares to flee to it for fear of mankind the fact is it is most important for the world to keep up the appearance of being compassionate but this it made out by divine compassion to be a falsehood 
and therefore away with divine compassion but now the inviter represents precisely this divine compassion and therefore he was sacrificed and therefore even those that suffered fled from him for they comprehended and humanly speaking very exactly what is true of most human infirmities that one is better off to remain what one is than to be helped by him in the second place the inviter likewise had an other and altogether different conception than the purely human one as to what constitutes man's misery and in this sense only he was intent on helping for he had with him neither money nor medicine nor anything else of this kind indeed the inviter's appearance is so altogether different from what human compassion would imagine it that he is a downright offence to men in a purely human sense there is something positively cruel something outrageous something so exasperating as to make one wish to kill that person in the fact of his inviting to him the poor and the sick and the suffering and then not being able to do anything for them except to promise them remission of their sins let us be human man is no spirit and when a person is about to die of starvation and you say to him i promise you the gracious remission of your sins that is revolting cruelty in fact it is ridiculous though too serious a matter to laugh about well for in quoting these sentiments i wish merely to let offended man discover the contradiction and exaggerate it it is not i who wish to exaggerate well then the real intention of the inviter was to point out that sin is the destruction of mankind behold now that makes room as the invitation also made room almost as if he had said procol o oh, procol este profani or as if even though he had not said it a voice had been heard which thus interpreted the come hither of the invitation there surely are not many sufferers who will follow the invitation and even if there were one who although aware that from this inviter no actual worldly help was to be expected nevertheless had sought refuge with him touched by his compassion now even he will flee from him for is it not almost a bit of sharp practice to profess to be here out of compassion and then to speak about sin indeed it is a piece of cunning unless you are altogether certain that you are a sinner if it is a toothache which bothers you or if your house is burned to the ground but if it has escaped you that you are a sinner why then it was cunning on his part it is a bit of sharp practice of him to assert i heal all manner of disease in order to say when one approaches him the fact is i recognize only one disease which is sin of that i shall cure all them that labor and are heavy laden all them that labor to work themselves free from the power of sin that labor to resist the evil and to vanquish their weaknesses but succeed only in being heavy laden of this malady he cures all persons even if there were but a single one who turned to him because of this malady he heals all persons but to come to him on account of any other disease and only because of that is about as useful as to look up an eye doctor when you have fractured your leg christianity as the absolute contemporaneousness with christ with its invitation to all that labor and are heavy laden christianity has entered the world not as the clergy whimperingly and falsely introduce it as a shining paragon of mild grounds of consolation but as the absolute god wills it so because of his love but it is god who wills it and he wills it as he wills it he does not choose to have his nature changed by man and become a nice 
that is to say humane god but he chooses to change the nature of man because of his love for them neither does he care to hear any human impertinence concerning the why and wherefore of christianity and why it entered the world it is and is to be the absolute therefore all the relative explanations which may have been ventured as to its why and wherefore are entirely beside the point possibly these explanations were suggested by a kind of human compassion which believes it necessary to haggle a bit god very likely does not know the nature of man very well his demands are a bit exorbitant and therefore the clergy must haggle and beat him down a bit maybe the clergy hit upon that idea in order to stand well with men and reap some advantage from preaching the gospel for if its demands are reduced to the purely human to the demands which arise in man's heart why then men will of course think well of it and of course also of the amiable preacher who knows how to make christianity so mild if the apostles had been able to do that the world would have esteemed them highly also in their time however all this is the absolute but what is it good for then is it not a downright torment why yes you may say so from the standpoint of the relative the absolute is the greatest torment in his dull languid sluggish moments when man is dominated by his sensual nature christianity is an absurdity to him since it is not commensurable with any definite wherefore but of what use is it then answer peace it is the absolute and thus it must be represented that is in a fashion which makes it appear as an absurdity to the sensual nature of man and therefore it is ah so true and in still another sense so true when the worldly wise man who is contemporaneous with christ condemns him with the words he is literally nothing quite true for he is the absolute and being absolute christianity has come into the world not as a consolation in the human sense in fact quite on the contrary it is ever reminding one how the christian must suffer in order to become or to remain a christian sufferings which he may if you please escape by not electing to be a christian there is indeed an unbridgeable gulf fixed between god and man it therefore became plain to those contemporary with christ that the process of becoming a christian that is being changed into the likeness of god is in a human sense a greater torment and wretchedness and pain than the greatest conceivable human suffering and moreover a crime in the eyes of one's contemporaries and thus will it always be that is if becoming a christian in reality means becoming contemporaneous with christ and if becoming a christian does not have that meaning then all your chatter about becoming a christian is a vanity a delusion and a snare and likewise a blasphemy and a sin against the holy ghost for with regard to the absolute there is but one time namely the present he who is not contemporaneous with the absolute for him it does not exist at all and since christ is the absolute it is evident that in respect to him there is but one situation contemporaneousness the three or seven or fifteen or seventeen or eighteen hundred years which have elapsed since his death do not make the least difference one way or the other they neither change him nor reveal either who he was for his real nature is revealed only to faith christ let me say so with the utmost seriousness is not an actor neither is he a merely historical personage 
since being the paradox he is an extremely unhistorical personage but precisely this is the difference between poetry and reality contemporaneousness the difference between poetry and history is no doubt this that history is what has really happened and poetry what is possible the action which is supposed to have taken place the life which has taken form in the poet's imagination but that which really happened the past is not necessarily reality except in a certain sense namely in contrast with poetry there is still lacking in it the criterion of truth as inwardness and of all religion there is still lacking the criterion the truth for you that which is past is not a reality for me but only my time is that which you are contemporaneous with that is reality for you thus every person has the choice to be contemporaneous with the age in which he is living and also with one other period with that of christ's life here on earth for christ's life on earth or sacred history stands by itself outside of history history you may read and hear about as a matter of the past within its realm you can if you so care judge actions by their results but in christ's life here on earth there is nothing past it will not wait for the assistance of any subsequent results in its own time eighteen hundred years ago neither does it now historic christianity is sheer moonshine and unchristian muddle-headedness for those true christians who in every generation live a life contemporaneous with that of christ have nothing whatsoever to do with christians in the preceding generation but all the more with their contemporary christ his life here on earth attends every generation and every generation severally as sacred history his life on earth is eternal contemporaneousness for this reason all learned lecturing about christianity which has its haunt and hiding place in the assumption that christianity is something which belongs to the past and to the eighteen hundred years of history this lecturing is the most unchristian of heresies as every one would readily recognize if he but tried to imagine the generation contemporaneous with christ as lecturing no we must ever keep in mind that every generation of the faithful is contemporaneous with him if you cannot master yourself so as to make yourself contemporaneous with him and thus become a christian or if he cannot as your contemporary draw you to himself then you will never be a christian you may if you please honor praise thank and with all worldly goods reward him who deludes you into thinking that you are a christian nevertheless he deceives you you may count yourself happy that you were not contemporaneous with one who dared to assert this or you may be exasperated to madness by the torment like that of the gadfly of being contemporaneous with one who says this to your face in the first case you are deceived whereas in the second you have at least had a chance to hear the truth if you cannot bear this contemporaneousness and do not bear to see this sight in reality if you cannot prevail upon yourself to go out into the street and behold it is god in that loathsome procession and if you cannot bear to think that this will be your condition also if you kneel and worship him then you are not essentially a christian in that case what you will have to do is to admit the fact unconditionally to yourself so that you may above all preserve humility and fear and trembling when contemplating what it means really to be a christian for that way you must proceed in order to learn and to practice how to flee to grace so that you will not seek it in vain but do not for god's sake go to any one to be consoled
for to be sure it is written blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see which word the priests have on the tips of their tongues curiously enough at times perhaps even to defend a worldly finery which if contemporary with christ would be rather incongruous as if these words had not been said solely about those contemporaries of his who believed if his exaltation had been evident to the eyes so that every one without any trouble could have beheld it why then it would be incorrect to say that christ abased himself and assumed the guise of a servant and it would be superfluous to warn against being offended in him for why in the world should one take offence in an exalted one arrayed in glory and how in the world will you explain it that christ fared so ill and that everybody failed to rush up admiringly to behold what was so plain ah no he hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him isaiah fifty three verse two and there was to all appearances nothing remarkable about him who in lowly guise and by performing signs and wonders constantly presented the possibility of offence who claimed to be god in lowly guise which therefore expresses in the first place what god means by compassion and by one's self needing to be humble and poor if one wishes to be compassionate and in the second place what god means by the misery of mankind which again in both instances is extremely different from what men mean by these things and which every generation to the end of time has to learn over again from the beginning and beginning in every respect at the same point where those who were contemporary with christ had to start that is to practice those things as contemporaries of christ human impatience and unruliness is of course of no avail whatsoever no man will be able to tell you in how far you may succeed in becoming essentially a christian but neither will anxiety and fear and despair help one sincerity toward god is the first and the last condition sincerity in confessing to oneself just where one stands sincerity before god in ever aiming at one's task however slowly one may proceed and if it be but crawling one is at any rate in the right position and is not misled and deceived by the trick of changing the nature of christ who instead of being god is thereby made to represent that sentimental compassion which is man's own invention by which men instead of being lifted up to heaven by christianity are delayed on their way and remain human and no more the moral and what then does all this signify it signifies that every one in silent inwardness before god is to feel humility before what it means to be in the strictest sense a christian is to confess sincerely before god what his position is so that he may worthily partake of the grace which is offered to every one who is not perfect that is to every one and it means no more than that for the rest let him attend to his work and find joy in it let him love his wife rejoicing in her let him raise his children to be a joy to him and let him love his fellow men and enjoy life god will surely let him know if more is demanded of him and will also help him to accomplish it for in the terrifying language of the law this sounds so terrible because it would seem as if man by his own strength were to hold fast to christ whereas in the language of love it is christ that holds fast to him as was said then god will surely let him know if more is demanded of him but what is demanded of every one 
is that he humble himself in the presence of god under the demands of ideality and therefore these demands should be heard and heard again and again in all their absoluteness to be a christian has become a matter of no importance whatever a mummery something one is anyway or something one acquires more readily than a trick in very truth it is high time that the demands of ideality were heard but if being a christian is something so terrifying and awesome how in all the world can a man get it into his head to wish to accept christianity very simply and if you so wish quite according to luther only the consciousness of sin if i may express myself so can force one from the other side grace exerts the attraction can force one into this terror and in the same instant the christian ideal is transformed and is sheer mildness grace love and pity looking at it any other way however christianity is and shall ever be the greatest absurdity or else the greatest terror approach is had only through the consciousness of sin and to desire to enter in any other way amounts to a high crime of less majesty against christianity but sin or the fact that you and i individually are sinners has at present either been done away with or else the demands have been lowered in an unjustifiable manner both in life the domestic the civic as well as the ecclesiastic and in science which has invented the new doctrine of sin in general as an equivalent one has hit upon the device of helping men into christianity and keeping them in it by the aid of a knowledge of world historic events of that mild teaching the exalted and profound spirit of it about christ as a friend etc etc all of which luther would have called stuff and nonsense and which is really blasphemy aiming as it does at fraternizing impudently with god and with christ only the consciousness of being a sinner can inspire one with absolute respect for christianity and just because christianity demands absolute respect it must and shall to any other way of looking at it seem absurdity or terror just because only thereby can the qualitative and absolute emphasis fall on the fact that it is only the consciousness of being a sinner which will procure entrance into it and at the same time give the vision which being absolute respect enables one to see the mildness and love and compassion of christianity the poor in spirit who acknowledge themselves to be sinners they do not need to know the least thing about the difficulties which appear when one is neither simple nor humble-minded but when this humble consciousness of oneself for example the individual's being a sinner is lacking ay even though one possessed all human ingenuity and wisdom and had all accomplishments possible to man it will profit him little christianity will in the same degree rise terrifying before him and transform itself into absurdity or terror until he learns either to renounce it or else by the help of what is nothing less than scientific propedeutics apologetics etc that is through the torments of a contrite heart to enter into christianity by the narrow path through the consciousness of sin